Uh, we have, in the last couple of decades, legalized gambling in the country. What do you think has happened to illegal gambling in the country when we legalize gambling? Well, the answer is it's gone up, not down. Well, why is that? That's because the legal gambling builds the market for the illegal gambling. The illegal gambling, you don't get taxed on illegal gambling. You are taxed for legal gambling. Illegal gambling doesn't have any hours that are limitation. Legal gambling does. Illegal gambling doesn't have any limits on credit and other things. Legal gambling does. So what happens is there's arguments for legal gambling. Sure, there are arguments. But one of the arguments is not that it does in illegal gambling because it flat doesn't do that. And neither would legalizing drugs. Well, you know, there's almost no policy that will eliminate a black market. I mean, alcohol is legal, but there's still a black market for uh, underage, you know, uh, people to, to get alcohol. There's still a market for after hours clubs and things like that. There's still with cigarettes you have. It's legal almost everywhere, but there's still smuggling between states and countries, depending upon what the tax rates are. So I don't think we're ever going to get rid of the black market, but moving in the direction of decriminalization, actually legal regulation of the drugs that are now illegal, would involve reducing the black market dramatically, dramatically. If we could reduce the marijuana from being 99 to 100 percent black market down to 20 percent black market, where the 80 percent is being taxed and regulated and people were getting it from legal sources, that would be a tremendous step forward. It oftentimes seems that enforcement, particularly of the drug laws, uh, disproportionately involves uh, minority populations more so than majority populations. Uh, but again, uh, if, if we examine in detail some of the specifics, uh, we will find that, uh, that the, the incidence of, uh, of trafficking in certain communities, particularly in inner city communities, um, that incidence is somewhat higher. And so uh, if, if, if you're required as a law enforcement officer would be required to enforce the laws equally in urban areas as well as suburban areas, uh, you're going to try to minimize the problem as much as possible for the citizens of the areas that you have jurisdiction over. Uh, that would mean enforcement of those laws in the inner city areas where you're likely to encounter uh, a greater proportion of minority citizens. Blacks use drugs at no greater rate than white people use drugs overall. But what we see in the data of the criminal justice system is they are arrested for drug offenses at twice the rate that they are drug users. They are uh, prosecuted more frequently than white people. And, and rather, and white people get diversion. They are twice as likely to be convicted as white people for drug offenses. They get sentenced to prison more often than white people. Their sentences, on average, are longer than those of white people. And as a consequence, there are many more blacks in prison for drug offenses. There's no question, you know, people use, certainly kids experiment to the same extent, whether they're black or white, Hispanic. But in terms of getting hooked, the, the affluent kid, whose parents have access to treatment, who have access to people, is less likely to get hooked than the poor kid who doesn't have access to those services. So that's one problem. Number two, uh, you know, uh, if, if you're a movie star and you get picked up for snorting cocaine, you, you got a thousand dollar an hour lawyer who's going to court with you and he's going to take care of everything and he's going to make sure you get into a soft rehab program and roll out. If you're a poor black kid that doesn't have a lawyer and he's going to get a lawyer assigned to him, uh, you, you're, not going to, you're not getting adequately represented. Well, I think you have to think about the entire criminal justice system because you're not just talking about uh, drug crimes. I mean, this would be true for other crimes as well. Uh, where you would see this. And, and my understanding is that when uh, the uh, specifics of the cases are looked at in terms of how many offenses the people have committed, uh, what the other associated factors are that have to do with sentencing, uh, that the racial disparities disappear. According to Bill Bennett, when he was drug czar, 85 percent 
of the cocaine users in America, this is a statement that he made, 85% of the cocaine users in America are white, male, high school educated, with a full-time job. Now, do we see that reflected in our prison system? Because there are so many states that say, if you've ever been convicted of a crime, a, a felony, you will never vote again. Because today, almost all drug violations are felonies. And because we are imprisoning black men at a per capita rate seven to eight times that of white men, because of all those things, 14.5% of all black men in this whole country will never vote again. I'm oftentimes uh, surprised and disappointed about how few people, even among minorities, recognize the extent to which the origins of the drug laws are about racism. I mean, the first anti-opium laws were directed at Chinese minorities in California, Nevada in the 1870s and 80s. The first anti-cocaine laws were at blacks in the South in the first decade of the 20th century. The first anti-marijuana laws were directed at Mexican-Americans and Mexican migrants in the Southwest of the United States in the teens and 20s. So these, these laws are steeped in racism. They continue to have a racist impact. Uh, you know, one of the best ways to address racial injustice in our society would be to end the drug war. That won't end racial injustice, but it will, pro it will reduce dramatically the opportunities for it to be manifested.